Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Dr. Chiedo Wankwo. I direct the SAIS Women Lead and teach with the African Studies Program here at SAIS. We will be discussing the need to gender the post-pandemic global economic recovery. But before we continue, um, a few housekeeping notes. The chats will be open for the next few minutes. Uh, feel free to say hello to the panelists if you wish. And we will open up the chat again um, about 10 minutes before the end of the event. So you can say your thank yous and goodbyes should you wish to uh, do so. Please send me your comments and questions to the panelists using the Q&A button um, on the bottom of your screen. Also, uh, feel free to engage with us via Twitter at size WL. We also have a newsletter which you can register for in the chat. Um, just so you know, this event is on record and you can watch at the link provided in the chat. So um, COVID-19 has completely changed the world as we knew it. Not only has it changed the world, it has also exposed and exacerbated deep structural underlying inequalities that exist both within and across countries the world over. The disproportionate impact of the pandemic on women's income as seen, for example, in the mass exit of women from the formal labor sector into the precarious informal sector, women's security or the lack thereof as seen in the increased incidence of physical, sexual and psychological violence against women and women's health as seen in the sidelining of healthcare for non-COVID-19 diseases has become quite clear. These past 10 months have laid bare the fact that gender is a significant determinant of economic opportunities and outcomes for individuals and groups across the world. A fact that the epistemic community on feminist policy making have been fighting to make consequential within the architecture of governance, both at the local and national levels, as well as on the global arena for decades. Women are excluded from structures and institutions where these decisions about resource distribution and redistribution are made. And in few cases where a few women have succeeded in gaining seats on the table, these women have had to swim against the current of the predominant male voices and struggle to infuse feminist content into organizational or institutional decisions and policies. To bring a gender lens and add feminist levers into policies, governments, institutions, and organizations need to include women in equal numbers into decision-making. Using data from 114, 41 countries across the world, a World Bank study conducted in 2018 estimates the global economic cost of gender inequality at $160.2 trillion, based on the assumption, of course, that women earn as much as men. This, of course, is before the pandemic hit. Clearly, the picture has gotten worse. This should incentivize governments, if nothing else, to pay closer attention to the issue of gender inequality. The significant changes resulting from COVID-19 demands a paradigm change in the way governments have functioned before now. If the war stands any chance of fully recovering from the devastations and disruptions from the pandemic, to help us get a deeper understanding into what this means and how to achieve this, I have the pleasure of speaking with three experts in the field. Women who have dedicated their lives work to the advancement of peoples and communities across the world with a notable passion for women's well-being. Joining us today is Anita Batia, Deputy Executive Director for Resource Management, Sustainability and Partnership for the United Nations Women, called UN Women. Also joining us is Dr. Alicia Barasena Ibarra, the United Nations Executive Secretary of Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Also joining us is Dr. Nancy Forbre, a feminist economist and director of the Program on Gender and Care Work at the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you all for being with us. Um, so, Dr. Ferber, let's, let's start with you, if you will. How should we understand the concept of gendering the post-pandemic economic recovery? And why do we need 
a paradigm change. Okay, thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. And I'm hoping Sonia can, um, can put up my PowerPoint slides. Thank you so much. So um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm an economist, feminist economist. I work mostly on the care sector of the economy with a particular focus on unpaid care. Um, and so that's the kind of perspective I bring uh, today. Next slide. So if I were gonna summarize the impact of COVID-19 on the global economy, I would say its main impact has been a big shock to the care sector. So it's been a shock to paid jobs and health, education, social services. And it's also been a really big shock to unpaid, unpaid family and community care. Uh, two things have gone on at once. On the one hand, there's a big increase in the demand for care and the need um, for healthcare, childcare, elder care. But at the same time, the cost of providing care services has gone up. Uh, you can think of it as kind of a metaphorical price because health risks themselves are costly and also protections against infection are also costly. And uh, the risk of infection means that um, we need to reduce social contact. So we're losing the economies of scale in care provision and in, in childcare uh, in education and in healthcare uh, that we once enjoyed. And we're finding that digital solutions are, are, are pretty tricky and difficult to adjust to. So, which is kind of what we're trying to do right now with a seminar via Zoom. So, as I think everyone recognizes, women are, are overrepresented in the care sector, uh, both in paid and unpaid work. And as a result, they're really bearing the brunt of, of, the, uh, of the shock uh, that we're experiencing. Next. A another thing to keep in mind is that I think the pandemic has really heightened our awareness of our own interdependence. Um, you know, now that we're cut off from really um, a lot of ways of being literally in touch with one another, um, I think it's complicating the way we understand our place in the world and, and public policy. So, um, you know, right now, everybody needs more cooperation and more care, but the opportunities to provide it are kind of constricted. And I think that's creating uh, a fair amount of cultural dislocation. And in this context, political leadership and cultural leadership becomes really, really important. That's something that we've uh, gained a very fierce appreciation of in the United States. Next. So I thought I would just uh, lay out some general principles and then um, point you to what I think is a good national policy exemplar. And then I want to um, focus in very briefly on the relevance to Africa in particular. Next. So the first and I think most pressing uh, point that I have to make is that we really need to look beyond standard measures of economic success. Uh, Gross domestic product is important, but it's not the whole story. And we need a much bigger dashboard of economic indicators to assess our success in the policy arena. I'm a big fan of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I think we'll probably hear more about that um, in the course of this uh, seminar. I also feel it's very important to recognize the value of unpaid care work and the instrument that we have uh, to do that is time use surveys. They have to be uh, designed better and they have to be administered more consistently for us to make really good use of them. And um, our measurement of them really helps our ability to articulate the need for more public support for unpaid care work. And I just wanna emphasize that this is an agenda that spans all countries from the richest countries in the world to the poorest countries in the world. I know there are really important differences, cultural differences, um, contextual differences, but um, it's, it's a strikingly uh, uh, kind of universal set of priorities. Next. 
So I, I want to point you to an example, I think, of a really good intervention by a feminist economist group in a policy discussion. And this is my good friend, Diane Elson, pictured here. She's the uh, chair of a commission in the UK, part of the UK Women's Budget Group um, that has uh, for many, for several years, uh, uh, put a, cast a sort of critical eye on UK um, budget priorities. And they've just published a report online called Creating a Caring Economy, a Call to Action. And I put the URL here for you. I, I really recommend it as a, a way of kind of framing uh, the larger issues and using the vocabulary of gender equality and care to try to move the, the policy uh, discussion forward. Um, there are many other examples of really good interventions in this direction, but this, this is one that's just came out and is available online. So I'm looking forward to, to um, telling you more about it in the questions if you're interested. Next slide. Uh, there are, uh, there's a lot of interesting research out there that I want to point you to on um, uh, the kind of nexus between gender and care in developing countries. And the um, uh, sources that I think are particularly important are the International Development Research Center in Canada, the Institute for Development Studies in the UK, and Oxfam International. And, a lot of really good research showing that investments in social and physical infrastructure improve the productivity of unpaid care and therefore improve the productivity of the overall economy, albeit in ways that are not really captured by conventional measures. And I wrote a um, kind of a review essay of this research um, for IDRC, and I put the URL here in case you want to check that out. And it's also a short version of it is also forthcoming in a book that IDRC has just published. Next slide. Um, they literally sent me uh, the cover this morning. It's called Women's Economic Empowerment. And again, I think it summarizes a lot of very concrete empirical research. It's uh, being published uh, in February by Routledge, but it will, will be, they tell me, available online for free. Um, uh, after that date. So it's something you should, you could mark down as a, a resource to take advantage of in the future. Next slide. Um, I think Africa has an uh, interesting and important precedent for dealing with the um, COVID-19 pandemic, and that is the uh, response um, to, to HIV. And uh, a few years ago, the Waru Commission interviewed home-based caregivers in 13 African countries trying to understand and analyze uh, the kind of stresses and strains that that particular caregiving challenge uh, posed. And I I'm, I'm just wanted to mention it to you today because I think it makes a really strong case for public compensation for individuals who are caring for sick or disabled friends and, and family members. And um, so I recommend it to you. Next slide. Bottom line, uh, you know, main thing to take away from my perspective as an economist, is that we need to make healthcare a top priority. And uh, it's absolutely vital to economic recovery. So we really need to fight back against efforts to say there's a trade-off between improving healthcare and uh, restoring economic growth. Those two things are complements uh, and they really go together and women have a particularly important stake in them. So looking forward to some um, comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, um, Dr. Fabre. Uh, now let's uh, get Dr. Ibarra's thoughts on the uh, subject. Dr. Ibarra. Is that me, Chidio? Yes. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I'm no. Sorry. no, it's because at the beginning you said Alicia Barnes and Ibarra, so I didn't know if you were calling me. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Oh, You're please. Right. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. 
Uh, okay, so let me let me say that first of all, how pleased I am to be in this conversation. I think it's a very relevant conversation, and I'm very happy to to share it with uh, such a great panelists. So let me quickly share uh, my presentation, if I may. I hope you can see it, Chido. So um, I'm so happy to join uh, you and women and so many very distinguished uh, panelists here. So what, what do, can we say from the Latin American and, and Caribbean perspective to advance what we call women's autonomy on the three fronts, economic autonomy, social autonomy, autonomy and political autonomy. We believe these three are, are essential and of course physical autonomy, which I will refer in a minute. What are the key messages I would like to transmit today? First of all, the COVID pandemic will result in the worst economic contraction in a century in this region. And it's magnifying structural inequalities related to poverty, inequality, gender, of course, and lack of innovation. Gender inequality has been exacerbated because women disproportionately are affected by increasing unemployment, poverty, and greater burden on unpaid and care and domestic work. And we do need gender sensitive fiscal policies. Governments are putting together fiscal policies, almost up to 4% of GDP. But we need them to focus also on and to really understand that women play such a crucial role in this care economy because without women, what would be the, the, the results of this pandemic? So, and we need a political compact at all levels for, for, on femin based on feminist principles for redistribution of power, time, and work. And we need to invest in care economy as you, we just heard, because it's really a key sector and we should see care economy as a, as a public good, you know, because women are caring for our legacy, the elder, for the, for the future, the children and, 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 and the disabled so, and, the, and, the, and the planet. So we definitely need to consider this more, more carefully. Contraction of minus 9.1% with rising inequality and poverty. Yes, as you said, uh, the SDGs are in, in, in very critical moment, especially SDG 1, poverty, SDG 5, gender equality, and of course, inequality. And we see that there is an overburden, as I said, on care economy, but also the patriarchal patterns uh, the, with the increase of violence. Women are also in very risky sectors and they are losing jobs and income. And there is a profound digital divide. You know, here in this region, we have 40 million households that do not have digital connection. And of course, with the, with the closing of schools, the, the children are on top of the heads of the women and, and with no digital connectivity, that, that is really an, an additional burden. So, and, and we see that poverty is going to rise profoundly in this region. We're gonna get 231 million people in poverty and extreme poverty, 96 million. Of this, we're gonna have 118 million uh, women that will fall into poverty and we will have 21 million women that will be unemployed. And this is really very serious. One of each two women are employed in informal jobs. That informality is rising almost to 56% in this region. So we're talking really a serious business here because informality also means that they don't have social protection. And listen, this is a very important feature and that is that indeed women have more years of schooling between the age of 15 and 24, more than men, they have 10.3 years versus 9.8 years of, of men, uh, of boys. But the problem is labor participation. You can see here that women only come in 51.3% versus 74 of men. And women, of course, as we said, we need to improve their economic autonomy. They are not receiving equal salaries. And women, of course, they need to improve that economic autonomy. COVID-19 is deepening the care crisis. First of all, women used to spend 22 or 40, uh, to 42 hours per week in unpaid care and domestic work. This um, I think we might have lost um, Dr. Barcena there.
Hello, Dr. Barsena, can you hear us? Um, and so we will just go ahead and uh, put up a poll. Uh, let's take um, poll questions at this point while we wait. Okay, we're back. Okay. okay, I'm here. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened, honestly. No it idea. Happens. It's technology. It oh happens. my God. Right. Anyway, so let me come back to the presentation then, if I can share it again. Of course. Okay, so let me quickly, uh, uh, I, I don't know until when you heard, so uh, can you tell me if, if you heard something or nothing? Um, um, I'm not. We heard this, Alicia, we heard you all the way up. You were on this slide when we lost you. Okay, okay, okay. This is Anita. So, so, yes. Oh, thank you, Anita. So I can leave the slide then, so I can continue. Okay, <laughs> so what's, the, can you see the slides now, right? So yes. the thing is that uh, prior to the, to the COVID, we, women used to spend 22 to 42 hours per week in unpaid care and domestic work absorbing and now they are absorbing even more because the classes, the education centers have been closed and the health sector, in the health sector, women are represented up to 73% of the, of the workers in the health sector are women and they are receiving 25% less salary for equal jobs. So that is really very unfair. And we believe that uh, there's gonna be a, a major uh, problem. We have an observatory that I invite you all to visit it, where we are mapping out all the measures and actions that are taken by the 33 uh, countries of Latin America and the Caribbean in key areas for gender equality. We're doing this together with UN Women. And I want to thank Anita because they are being so good because they have national representatives that are providing us with information on gender violence, on care economy, on employment, on benefits. So we are following up what countries are doing each country by country, and we are exposing that to make sure that they are able to do much more. And of course, we have a, a, a regional conference on women that we organized together with UN Women, and we had a very important political commitment from the 33 authorities on, on women's empowerment in the region, ministers of women, uh, women's ministers, and also we have more than 400 NGOs participating last January, and it came out as Santiago Commitments, which is actually, believe me or not, a really guide for recovery and transformation to go for gender sensitive macroeconomic policies, basically on fiscal, we will talk about that in, in, in the last slide, design comprehensive care systems. We have to use examples like Uruguay, who has a national care system which uh, liberates the time of women and, 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 uh, and helps them to be incorporated into the labor market. And of course, we have to protect the human rights of all domestic workers, particularly migrants, I have to say. Trade is very important. How do we move women with their small and medium-sized enterprises that participate in trade? How do we internationalize and help them? And also, how do we incorporate women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which is going to help them to go into more productive sectors? So, to economic recovery and transformation with gender equality at the center should recognize and redistribute power, time, work, and resources. We really need to break the statistic silence and make sure that we disaggregate the numbers. We need to empower women in three autonomies, economic, social, and political, through a political compact at the national and regional level. We need gender sensitive fiscal policies and budget allocations for employment protection in the formal and the informal sectors, including care leave and pay leave support productive inclusion. We need skill sets for women, capacity building and digital inclusion. We are proposing a, a, a basic digital basket that includes a laptop, a iPhone, a tablet, and very low cost connectivity so women can come into the digital revolution. Protect women against uh, domestic violence and guarantee sexual and reproductive rights 
and expand public and private care services with proper remuneration and social protection. What we are talking about is how do we move towards a culture of rights, equality, and not discrimination, and move away from the culture of privilege that has been uh, in our region uh, very hard. So thank you so much for your attention. I look forward for having a productive discussion. Uh, back to you, Shado. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Um, Barsena. And um, at l last uh, but not least for this session, let's go to Anita Bartia. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nwankor. I'm trying to start my video. Okay, here we go. Okay, great. Can you see and hear me? Um, yes. Great. So first of all, thank you so much uh, to SAIS and to the Women Lead Program for inviting me to be on this distinguished panel. I'm really pleased uh, to be here today with um, my dear colleague uh, Alicia and uh, with uh, Dr. Fulbright, a real privilege to be with both of you uh, and to have an opportunity to speak to our audience wherever they may be. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's here. Um, you know, both presentations have been so wonderful um, and I both learned and was inspired by them. And I would like to just uh, start by perhaps picking up on some of the themes that have already been alluded to, but I think are worth underscoring. First of all, just to reiterate, because I don't think it can be said enough, that this pandemic is not gender neutral and that there is a differential impact on women versus men in this crisis and that needs bears repeating over and over again because we are seeing in the sum of policy responses today real blindness to the issue of the differential impacts of the crisis uh, on gender um, and on uh, women. Second, I think there are many areas in which women have been affected but I want to focus on three and to talk about what are the specific measures, both in the short term as well as in the medium term that we need to think about. So the three areas and both, uh, on both have to do with income, have to do with health and have to do with security. And on income, we've seen some really startling numbers about uh, the fall back into poverty, which can be expected. Look, even before the pandemic, poverty was deeply feminized and the pandemic has just uh, made it so much worse. And we anticipate from UN Women's uh, estimates that as many as 50 million women will fall into poverty in just one year. So I think that's a really major concern for us. And of course, the pandemic has shown that the size of the informal sector has just ballooned as well. It was already very big and it's just gotten bigger. And I underscore these points because policy measures that we have seen to date, fiscal and monetary stimuli, do not recognize this. I'm sorry to say that the fiscal stimuli packages that we have seen to date are gender blind. And this is something that I personally have been speaking about and that needs to be brought to the attention of policymakers, particularly as the Bretton Woods meetings take place next week. And policymakers need to understand that as long as the stimuli are gender blind, they are not going to work. They are not going to work because you cannot leave out a whole segment of the population and expect your economy to recover. And if there is recovery, it will be lopsided. And it will be lopsided for the following reasons. First, even before the pandemic, female labor force participation was dropping in many countries for reasons that weren't really fully understood. For example, even in India, where you have seen a lot more women going to university and graduating, but this was not translating into labor market gains. So, you know, this was already the case before the pandemic and the pandemics just made it much worse. So policymakers need to pay attention to that. Policymakers need to pay attention to the fundamental issue of health, as Nancy said, because you cannot tell a woman who needs to get an abortion that she should come back in six months, right? And once she has a child, this has a long-term 
absolutely irreversible impact on the choices that she makes. So although we don't really talk that much about reproductive freedom and its uh, relevance to um, you know, the care uh, to, uh, to um, gender inequality in economic terms, it is actually very important to put that issue on the table because if women do not have access to contraception and to reproductive medicine, they will end up making choices that will affect their abilities to be productive members of society for the rest of their lives. And then third, the issue of security. Um, you know, if you're not safe, you are not able to be a productive member of society. It's as simple as that. So the scourge of gender-based violence needs to be addressed immediately. But there are two really cross-cutting fundamental issues that I want to flag. One is that we need to bring together the conversations on gender equality and the conversations on financing. Alicia, you and I have been on another meeting this morning and some other meetings recently where we've been talking about this. This has been a long-standing divide. It needs to be closed. This gap needs to be closed because gender issues cannot be the exclusive preserves of gender ministries. This has to be mainstreamed into thinking uh, by and attention paid by finance ministers as well, who when they are negotiating with the IFIs and who when they are thinking about the shape and the distribution of monies are thinking about how this is going to reach women. Second, it is really important to think about priorities in government spend. And frankly, priorities in a lot of government spend are pretty lopsided as we know, because we have not seen sufficient investments in the care economy and in the infrastructure for care. But the issue that was put on the table in Beijing 25 years ago needs to be resuscitated and needs to be resuscitated with vigor. And that is the question of defense spending. Why are countries spending so much on the military when you have an entire security sector, which is your infrastructure for a productive society that is left unattended? So we need to start having the conversation about the right amount of spend on defense and uh, reallocation of some of that money towards the social sectors. And then finally, the looming crisis that everybody is concerned about, rightly so, is the debt crisis. And we know from previous debt crises that women are disproportionately affected and they will be in this coming debt crisis as well. So we need to get governments to start thinking about smart ways to mobilize other sources of financing, such as private finance, um, where they have the fiscal space. Not many countries will in Africa, probably, uh, you know, Botswana and Namibia have some space to take on additional debt. Most of them, most countries will not. But where there is space and where you can roll over existing bond commitments, um, then I think one of the policy issues we should be looking at is innovative financing instruments like gender bonds, which have to be very carefully monitored on the ground by women's rights groups with a rights perspective and through certification from women's groups to ensure that the money does indeed flow towards issues that make for uh, a more gender equal society. But I think given the scarcity of public funding, we do need to think also about innovative ways to capitalize on the $80 trillion of assets sitting with institutional investors and pension funds, but to do so in a very hard-nosed way to make sure that there is no pink washing, but that the money is really going towards the right causes. I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, thank you so very much, um, Anita. That was quite uh, something. Um, and so just before we move into the Q&A session, uh, we'll just put up, um, to uh, Paul questions. And uh, if you don't mind uh, responding to those, um, that will, um, I believe, advance the goal of this event. And so the first question is up.
if we can go to the second. And the second question is up. And we will release the results of the poll uh, in the course of this event. Thank you. Um, okay, just um, if we can just move on with the question and um, Q and A session of the event. And um, if you don't mind, I will come to you first, um, Dr. Ibarra. Baxana Ibarra, you have mentioned often the importance of dropping the barriers in information technology and uh, providing technological inclusion and expanding um, technological inclusion. Can you speak more um, on this and how you think it would advance the gendering of the post pandemic global economic recovery? Thank you very much, and of course I can, and, and we have done a, a complete policy brief on digital inclusion, and we found out, as I said before, that 40 million households do not have internet connectivity, number one, that 46% of children between 5 and 12 years cannot do tele-education, and 21% cannot do tele-working. So, the, and of course, of these, of these households, the problem also is the velocity, the quality of the connectivity, which doesn't allow them to do two teleworking and teleeducation at the same time, for example. So this is posing a tremendous burden on women. So one of the things we are suggesting is that women should be provided with a, di a basic digital basket that includes a laptop, an iPhone, and a, a low cost connectivity uh, provision. And even, I mean, we are talking here of women of all, I mean, especially women that are not connected, that should be connected, because that will help their financial inclusion, will help all, all sorts of inclusion, honestly. And so we believe this has to be a high priority in the investment uh, in the digital economy. And secondly, to build up the skills of women. So, we, so they can participate uh, a, a, in, in an amplified way in the digital economy and the e-commerce. We did a report on this, and we're going to focus on this in the next year with, together with UN Women to go deeper and see where are the problems of the digital inclusion of women in particular, and of course of girls and young, and young women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Faber. Um, at some point this week, you had a tweet that went viral. It reads, please stop saying parents can't work because of childcare, school closure problems, and say instead, parents can't earn money. Taking care of kids is work. Parents' workload has increased, not decreased. Words matter. How do we grasp this message? And why do you think it has been so hard to understand? Well, you know, I think we just got used to this vocabulary that economists use about work. What's work? Um, work is having a paid job. Um, nothing else counts. And what's really interesting about the pandemic is it's just um, reveal the limitations of that vocabulary because we've all fallen back on and unpaid work has been the safety net. It has been our social safety net. And without it, we would be in really, really serious trouble. So I think we're, we're at a moment in time where kind of real world events are kind of shocking us into a better understanding of how we organize our time. Thank you. Um, Anita, uh, during the General Assembly, it took 50 men to speak before the first woman got her turn. 
What is your opinion on the current gender gap in COVID-19 governorship leadership, governance leadership, where men make up over 85% of the leadership positions? What does this say about the role of women in leading the reconstruction from top down, rather than being constrained, uh, limited only to leading from the bottom up? Well, needless to say, I have fairly strong views on this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it is an embarrassment that in 2021, we are having the issue of having women at the table is absolute right policies. And, you know, this is not just an assertion uh, because it is the right thing to do, which of course it is, but actually, there's plenty of evidence that when you have women at the table, you will have better outcomes, whether it's in women, peace and security, uh, whether it is governance of institutions or boards. Um, and so this is a fundamental issue of actually human rights uh, to have equal representation. The, uh, the example that you gave from the General Assembly is shocking. And it is a reflection of how far we still need to go with respect to having women <clears throat> equally represented in cabinets, in um, parliaments, um, and in leadership and decision-making roles generally. Uh, you know, when you switch on the television and you look at who's talking about the pandemic, Unfortunately, it is usually a sea of men. And uh, I think uh, I feel very proud to be part of the UN system where the Secretary General has actually made gender parity one of the pillars of his strategy and has taken really strong affirmative measures to make sure that there is gender parity, certainly at the senior levels, but also cascading throughout the system. I think without extraordinary measures, you know, we're still going to be in a place where when you are reporting on the two scientists who won the Nobel Prize for chemistry, you're still saying two female scientists won the award for chemistry versus saying two scientists won the award for chemistry. So, um, you know, this is a topic that we will be discussing next year at the Commission on the Status of Women. Um, and the whole issue of leadership has really been brought into sharp focus when you look at the outcomes in certain countries that are being led by women. And there's been a, you know, I don't know if there's causation, but certainly there seems to be correlation between uh, female leadership and good outcomes in the actual handling of the crisis, whether you look at Germany, Finland, New Zealand, uh, Taiwan, you know, the female leadership of these countries has led to some really sound decisions which are sadly not seen in some um, male-led uh, countries. This is not to say that there aren't enlightened male leaders. Of course there are, but there needs to be uh, attention again to this issue of representation and leadership at all levels. Thanks. You're on mute. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Barsena, uh, in a recent talk, you spoke about linking debt relief with sustainability. How is this achievable within this landscape? And what significance will that have for gendering the post-pandemic global economic recovery? Thank you so much. When we talk about sustainability and, and climate change, by the way, there is a double asymmetry. First of all, this region contributes with 8.3% of, the, of the, the greenhouse emissions, but is highly affected by the impact of climate change. First, uh, first asymmetry. The second asymmetry is precisely between men and women. And of course, between, uh, I would say, poor and rich country, uh, uh, people in, within the countries. The most vulnerable are the highest hit. So we have to take care of these asymmetries. And, and we have talked about which are those sectors that we have to work into. 
and we have identified several of them. Uh, energy transition is one, and how can women participate in the energy transition? Because we are talking about renewable energies that will create jobs and how women can be incorporated in those jobs. We're talking about a digital economy, as I said before, and of course, electromobility is one of the major things, transportation. And the third one is uh, uh, solutions based on nature. For example, agroecology, agroindustry, bioeconomy in general. And we are identifying where women can be inserted in those uh, type of, of businesses. And we believe, and so that's one part of the equation. But the second part is we are talking about a debt relief a concrete debt relief for the Caribbean countries where uh, we are talking about 57 billion of their debt. We are talking about a debt relief of 12%, $7 billion to create a Caribbean resilience fund that should be complemented with the Green Climate Fund to assist into the adaptation projects in the coastal areas, in the tourism sector, in the, in the ocean economy. And we are desegregating figures between men and women because in the Caribbean, uh, more than 50% of the jobs lost is from women in the tourism sector. So we need to support. So that's a very concrete proposal. And the other one is we are talking about relief of debt uh, services for the Central American countries. Just let me give you one figure so for you to understand what I'm talking about. The debt service in the, in the Central American com, uh, countries is up to 2.7% of GDP. And the health investment or the, the public uh, expenditure on health is 2.3. So they are, how can we do this? So we need alleviation of, of debt services that can be reinvested at least for the next one or two years really into sectors development sectors, and we think this has to be gender sensitive. And let me quickly, if I may, Shido, say to Nancy, thank you for raising this issue. Unpaid work is work. And we, that's why we are talking about work, not employment. We're talking about total work. And we have statistics on the use of time. We have done this, and we have done this with the statistics community to try to understand what is the economic contribution of the, of the unpaid work, both paid and unpaid, but of course the unpaid work, because this is work altogether and the economy has to recognize this. So thank you very much for raising that. Over to you, Shido. And oh, if I can say something, in the General Assembly, you know, this year only nine women participated. Last year it was 16 women. So we are not very well anyway, but the, the thing I would like to follow up, and maybe Anita, we can do that, is how many heads of state spoke about gender equality? Not only how many women were there, but how many recognized the importance of gender equality? Over. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Barsena. Um, very illuminating um, thoughts there. Um, Dr. Fabre. To follow up on Dr. Barsena's uh, response, lately, and uh, more because of the pandemic, there's been an increasing emphasis on um, the role of data and statistics pertaining to the shadow pandemic and women's well-being. What's your take on this? What should a feminist evaluation measure entail? And what is the importance of a feminist economic framework in advancing solutions for the post-pandemic global economic recovery? Oh, those are such big questions. I have a long list of data needs. I, I think we don't know enough about healthcare, who's getting healthcare and who's not. I don't, we don't know enough about essential workers, um, which, are the most health, which are the most risky jobs, who are the, where, where are the workplaces that are, are most vulnerable. And I think, you know, I, I think we re really need to rally around those particular health priorities, but also um, improving time use surveys um, expanding them, um, linking them in a better way to what households are doing in the uh, uh, paid work arena and to the level of community infrastructure uh, that's available for them. Um, uh, what else? Uh, I, I'm really interested in the national care system in Uruguay. I'd like to see more empirical assessment of what that national care system policy is doing 
And I think it's, it is a really important uh, model that, that, that we sh should all be looking at. And um, finally, I just want to say that I, it was interesting that people, um, a lot of people were kind of unsure of what feminist economic policy means. And I, I just want to say from my vantage point, it means really understanding that women have some collective interests as women and men have some collective interests as men, but also recognizing that those differences are cross-cut by very many, many other dimensions of identity, citizenship, class, race, ethnicity, and we really need to have a kind of intersectional approach to understanding social inequalities and always be concerned about building alliances um, among ourselves and with men around some of these uh, other social divisions. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Fabra. Um, Anita, uh, throughout the world, we have seen how COVID-19 has exacerbated linking gaps within service provision. How should countries ensure equitable service provision? Well, look, I think this, the first and most important thing is it actually has to be a priority. There has to be the political will to take on this issue. And I think the political will is actually missing in many countries. And, uh, you know, uh, Alicia referred to this um, issue of how many heads of state spoke about gender. Um, and women at the General Assembly. So, of course, on October 1st, we had the celebration of Beijing when lots of people, everybody spoke about gender equality on that day because it was specific to gender. But what was uh, conspicuous by its absence, actually, was enough reference to gender and to women in building back better. Everybody talked about the need of the General Assembly to have measures to deal with the crisis and what they were doing, but very few actually referred to the fundamental role that women play and will play in building back uh, better. So I think we have a long way to go in translating uh, political will into action. Even countries that have uh, quote unquote feminist foreign policies um, simply are not uh, doing enough in their current policy discussions to center women uh, at the heart of those provisions. There is, I, so I see a very big implementation gap and I see a very big gap between rhetoric and reality. And I think changing service provision actually starts with recognition of that gap and then very clear budgetary allocations. You know, it does boil down to public expenditure and the priorities that we have. And it's not enough to just say we have gender responsive budgeting because frankly, this term is used in very many, what I would call loose ways to say we are doing the right things. But when you look at the actual uh, distribution of funds, the transmission, where they are ending up, what the impacts are, uh, I think we have a very long way to go. So uh, for me, I think the first thing is you need to actually recognize that there is a problem and to translate the highfalutin political words that give people a lot of credibility on the global stage into very specific actions that show up in, your dis in the distribution of public expenditure and the articulation of public policy. Thank you, thank you so very much. And so um, I think at this point, we will bring in some um, audience questions. Um, this is from Ali Bratsky. I'm interested in your thoughts on the recent announcement that 127 WTO member states will establish an informal working group to increase women's participation in trade. Do you think this type of multilateral approach is likely to lead to meaningful steps towards women's economic empowerment? Is the group likely to produce measures that are enforceable? Or is the group's formation more of a symbolic gesture meant to placate activists given the current social climate? Um, Anita, do you mind uh, starting us off with this? 
Look, I think both global norms, I, I think global norms are important. You need frameworks, right? So I think it is important to have groups like this, but in the end, everything is country level implementation. So you actually have to see what is working at the country level. So, you know, I welcome um, having more attention on this issue, particularly on trade, because again, trade is very gendered. When you look at what is happening in global supply chains and you look at the impact of the breakdown of the global supply chains, knowing that women are usually at the bottom end of the value chain, whether it's as workers, distributors, suppliers, consumers, um, you, you, you see that the breakdown is having a very negative and disproportional impact on women. So obviously thinking about building back global supply chains and restarting global trade means paying attention to the particular role of women in global trade right now. And, I'm, and this is one sector where, frankly, there just isn't enough discussion about gender right now. There just isn't enough discussion. The global publications on this topic are actually quite gender blind. And so I think there needs to be more attention paid to, uh, to gender in trade discussions uh, anyway. But I think, um, you know, of course we welcome uh, new groups because they help to shine a light on the issues. But for me, the real uh, issue is how does the rubber hit the road uh, at the country level? What does that actually mean? in a country's own discussions and negotiations on uh, multilateral trade issues. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Barsena, um, are there specific recovery policies you see as transformatory for the Latin American and Caribbean countries' economies at the moment? Absolutely. We have suggested at least five uh, policy actions. Number one, to establish an, an emergency basic income for all the, per, all the people in situation of poverty, equivalent to one line of poverty, which is $150 a month. And we have calculated this for the whole 231 million people, but we have also calculated for the 118 million women. So women should be receiving a, a basic emergency income for one year, for one year. So that's number one. Number two, we are pulling together a hunger grant together with FAO. We did a very profound study. And by the way, the, the World Food Program just won the Nobel Prize today uh, to, to address precisely hunger. And that is uh, how, uh, what are the in-kind support that that the people should receive because hunger is increasing in our region. So we put together a hunger grant approach in which it, it is equivalent to one line of extreme poverty, which is $65 a month, but it should be given either in kind or, or monetary, it could be both. And the third one is this digital uh, basic basket, as I said before, which will cost 1% of GDP, which is not not that much, honestly, to have dig total digital inclusion in all the households of Latin America and the Caribbean. And the other actions are related to recovery. And that is, as I said before, to identify critical sectors that can generate employment, that can generate a transition, a, a real a build back different, let me say, not only better, but totally different. And different means that it has to be a feminist recovery. We need total gender inclusion in the recovery, absolutely. And it has to be sustainable, it has to be with equality at the center. So these are, so, and, and of course the last one is related to debt, to, to the international cooperation, come on. This is a systemic crisis and developed countries are also in trouble, not only developing countries, but developed countries have the fiscal space, have the money, have the, have the monetary, uh, I would say, uh, autonomy. We don't. We really need concessional funding in Latin America and the Caribbean, regardless of the level of income, because since they are considering us middle-income countries, we are being excluded from concessional funding. And I really believe that if, what, if we want gender equality, we have to put the money where our mouth is, and the international community has to put the money there. So we are talking about a financial 
I would say, and this is what Anita was talking about, the Secretary General and, and the Prime Minister of or Jamaica, the Prime Minister of Canada, have put together all the heads of state to discuss financing for development in the, in the era of COVID and beyond. And we believe that women have to be at the center of this strategy. Thank you. Um, Dr. Fabre, so um, what are some of the policy propositions you think would be considered radically pro-women that might now find their momentum in the post-pandemic recovery arena? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, I, I'll just emphasize the ones that lie within my area of expertise, um, but maybe with a little uh, twist inspired by the um, uh, COVID-19 experience. Um, in general, I'd like to see more support for unpaid work. Um, I'd like to see uh, paid family leaves. I'd like to see universal child care, universal el elder care support. I'd like to see it delivered to the extent possible in gender neutral ways, that is encouraging men uh, to participate in care as well as women. And there are some strategies for that um, that have been developed in the Nordic countries. Um, and I'd also like to see policies that um, are, get over the split between providing public services and providing uh, payment to families for unpaid care. I think what we've learned from the pandemic is that families need flexibility. They need public services uh, to rely on, but they also need support for the work they do at home. And we need to, um, in the past, I think feminist policymakers have tended to fight over those two options uh, because uh, they're justifiably concerned that support for family care might reinforce gender roles. I agree that's a risk, but I think it's a risk that we need to take uh, to articulate a feminist policy that's also a very pro-family policy. And I think that could help us overcome some of the differences that have kept us from um, having as unified a voice as we might otherwise have. Thank you. Um, Anita, um, is there a sense for how the fractures in the architecture of global governance um, as a result of this wave of populist and conservative nationalism across the world, with its tendency to competition um, rather than cooperation, is there any sense for how this will um, impact um, uh, post-pandemic uh, economic recovery, uh, particularly um, with regards to um, women's advancement? Really interesting question. And, you know, um, this year is the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. And so as part of that effort, the UN engaged in a global conversation. And uh, the office of the 75th anniversary actually reached out to people all over the world to say, you know, do you still see a role for the UN? What role do you see? And what was so affirming about what came back is that most people still recognize and actually want to see more global cooperation. You know, there is a real hunger for uh, a continuance of the multilateral system. And yes, it is very challenged by certain regimes and the zeitgeist is such that uh, we uh, are reminded every day uh, about, you know, populist streaks and, um, what I can only call, you know, increasingly democratically elected, increasing dictatorships, right? They're democratically elected, but they do not behave in democratic ways. And we have many of these regimes across the world. Um, but notwithstanding that, uh, I think we are seeing the global community come together and would we like to see more of it? Of course, but we do have the global community coming together. We have a very major effort which is, a globally, uh, which is a global effort to develop a vaccine through the ACT Accelerator. Um, of course, there are many issues of equity of access to the vaccine that we need to, will need to work through, and they are not easy issues. 
Um, so the, it is not, you know, a completely rosy picture. But uh, I think, uh, you know, the death of global cooperation is overstated. There is still ongoing global cooperation um, and the UN has played a fundamental role in the COVID response and recovery, both at the country level, but also at the global level by flagging the need for continued global cooperation on uh, vaccine development, on vaccine distribution, uh, and on the socioeconomic impact and need for uh, a common approach to the recovery. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bartsena, we know there's a tendency uh, for recovery processes and programs to lead to further exclusion of previously marginalized populations. How do we uh, make sure that it does not happen this time around, right? How do we prevent this um, transformation, um, uh, um, this, this planned um, uh, global economic transformation from exacerbating inequalities within communities? Well, thank you very much for this question. I think it's a very important question. And it has to be, it has to do with what type of transformation we want. What is the reset we are looking for? And we are looking for a total reset. And it has to be uh, based on, for example, the recognition of the unpaid work as, a, as Dr. Polbre has very rightly posed number one. Also, we have to highlight what are the principles that we have to have in the reset, in the transformation we are looking for, because we are definitely looking for a new, for a different future. So that's one. We want the, the, pay, the unpaid care economy to be visibilized and recognized and, and fully, uh, I would say, fully acknowledged from the economic perspective. Number two, we want it to be uh, based on equality. So equality has to be seen as a driver of growth. And thirdly, it has to be sustainable. That is, we cannot continue working against the planet. I think this is something that we really have to look into. Okay, so we agree on this, very fine. But the governments are not gonna do it alone. We do need a, a, a very profound civil society participation. And this is what our conference on, on women has engaged. We, are, we have more than 400 NGOs that, that are, and I have to say that the greatest feminists groups in Latin America, I mean, Latin America has tremendous uh, feminist groups in the Caribbean. So these are the, the people, these are the networks that we have to engage. If there is not public participation, it's impossible to do the reset because there are so many, I would say, uh, already interests that are, are there, the culture of privilege, the one that benefits the few, the concentration of wealth. So we are talking about the two things. I mean, the gender, uh, and I, I would say the feminist economy is about the quality. The history of the feminist groups is equality at the heart. So uh, we have to look at that, the lessons learned from the feminist groups and movements that it started before Beijing, I have to say, even. So uh, women have been pushing for equality for a long time. And now women are pushing for sustainability. But we need the participation of civil society. And we also need the engagement of the academics, like, like Nancy, thank you very much. And we also need the participation of the private sector. We need women. So that's why it's so important to have women in key positions because we are the ones responsible to bring other women into the equation. So that for me is essential. I think transformation needs, it has to be feminist or it will not be. Thank you. Um, Anita, are, are there best practices for engaging men and um, communities in developing women's capacity for economic independence? Look, I think the women's rights agenda and the gender equality agenda is a universal agenda. This cannot be done just by women. And obviously we need men and boys to be part of this conversation. Women has uh, programs on positive masculinity and the engagement of uh, <clears throat> men and boys through something called the He for She initiative. But actually this goes much deeper than that. Right. This is a cultural issue and it starts in the family unit. It starts at home very early on. It starts with the creation of norms 
and attitudes that are created first and foremost in the in the family unit. So it has to do with um, <clears throat> shifting attitudes, mindsets, and having educational curricula that support the shifting of the mindsets. Um, you know, there's a very famous song, and I'm trying to remember what it is, but it says something about hate is taught um, very early on. You know, people learn to hate, dislike, uh, act in certain ways at a very young age. And so we have to intervene in early childhood education to make sure that we are creating the right mindsets very early on and that we actually get um, men and boys engaged in the agenda. There is, of course, a fundamental role for public policy as well. You do need structures as the, you need tax systems, you need uh, attention to, um, as Nancy said, unpaid care work, to paid family leave. You need to build a whole social infrastructure that supports gender equality. You cannot have, you know, there's no one single uh, mad silver bullet. You know, it takes a systemic and structural transformation to actually get to the gender equality outcomes that we see in certain countries. But that has come from A, the political recognition that equality actually leads to better development outcomes, one, but two, the supporting infrastructure in terms of tax systems that can then finance the social investments that are needed to, um, uh, uh, for women to be able to uh, play their rightful role in society. Thank you. Um, Rebecca Fusetti, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that well, um, wants to know whether there are, um, how the uh, pandemic um, is affecting women's education and whether there are differences um, between how men and women react um, psychologically to the pandemic. And um, perhaps we will um, start with you, Anita. Um, so looking back at what we were reporting on from 25 years of the Beijing platform, you know, there were two things that we picked up in the national reviews from every country, which reported to us on how they were doing in the implementation of the Beijing platform. One was access to maternal uh, in, in improvements in maternal mortality. So we have seen positive changes in that in the last 25 years. And the other was access to educational opportunity. So, you know, we have seen improvements in um, access to educational opportunity. And I actually want to say one other thing about investments in uh, girls schooling and education. Many years ago, there was a paper written um, I think it was by Larry Summers, um, about how investments in girls' education probably has the highest impact of any other investment uh, in terms of um, influencing development outcomes because it changes. And I know this sounds a bit cliched, but it is actually true. And there is empirical evidence on this that the investment in girls' education changes her life, her family's life, her community's life, and her country's life. This is something that is very worrying right now because we are seeing that partly because of the digital divide that girls' access to education is being compromised during the pandemic. There is no other word for it, right? Because many places have had to switch to online and online is a luxury, let's face it. Half the world, you know, Alicia had some very startling numbers about how many people aren't connected into the digital world. So, you know, here we are, we are having two conversations. There are two worlds. There are the world, there's the world of the digitally connected where you can worry about, you know, the quality of your internet access. And there is a world which doesn't have anything. So, and unfortunately, the majority of the world lives in that second bucket. And this digital divide is compounded by cultural norms. Because I can tell you in many countries where you do have access, you may have that one laptop, 
If there's a choice between the girl child and the boy in the family, the cultural norms will be such that the girl child is sent off to do chores and it's the boy who has access to that computer. So there is a digital divide compounded by cultural uh, norms that is actually getting in the way of girls' education. And th there is a real risk that we have a whole generation of girls who do not get access to schooling. We have already seen at UN Women a rise in child marriage because um, you know poor parents are getting their girls married off because so that they don't have an additional economic burden during the pandemic. So there are multiple intersecting ways in which girls' education is being compromised today. And this is an absolutely urgent need for policymakers to focus on, because if we lose this generation of girls, we will not only lose the years of progress that we have made since Beijing, but we actually risk slipping back, you know, maybe 50 years more. I don't know what the numbers are, but it will be a very profound and systemic impact if we are not able to keep this generation of girls in school. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, and so we are almost here. Um, I wish we had more time to continue with this conversation. Um, but just um, to summarize, um, if you may, uh, could you take two minutes each um, to summarize your intervention here, right? So what must we do to ensure um, this paradigm change we're talking about? And if we may start with you, um, Dr. Fabra. Um, what must we do? Uh, we need to think harder. We need to organize harder. We need to build political alliances around our agenda. Um, I think most of all, we have to believe in the possibility of building a truly caring economy. And, and so if I may just quickly, um, we need to believe um, in the possibility of building a truly um, gendered economy. Um, so what happens, right? Um, what is the alternative? If we may just look at the, what are the counterfactuals here, right? What if that does not happen? Can you just paint a picture of what you think uh, might happen on the other side of this whole um, uh, disaster? Uh, well, I, I think the whole global economy is very much at risk of a permanent shutdown, not just as a result of the pandemic, but because of the very related process of, of climate change. These are both collective challenges. They can't be met by a neoliberal philosophy. They can't be met by market forces. They, they really require that just by their very nature, these problems require cooperation and um, commitment to a, a, a human future. So, I mean, in my view, we, you know, we either get it together or it's all over. Uh, I think the counterfactual is actually pretty stark. Well, thank you very much. Um, I thought it was really important that you paint the picture here uh, because um, it does appear that some of these concepts fly um, over some, you know, people's heads most times. So we wanted to uh, really outline what is at stake here, uh, not just for us, but also for our future generations. Um, um, Dr. Barsena, um, do you mind um, going next? I'm very happy to do that. I think that we have to address the structural challenges of gender inequality and to address them in terms of political autonomy, physical autonomy, and economic autonomy. We need the three fronts. Economic autonomy for us is a priority. It's a real priority. And that means to take into account the care economy and to bring it into the economy really, and that's why the name care economy or feminist economy is perfect because we need recognition. We need uh, to measure it. Uh, and that's very important. And to, and, to, and, and to certain way demonstrate the economic contribution of the care economy. Okay, number one. And then we need to, to really go into the structural challenges that women are confronting, like the sexual division of labor, number one, the patriarchal cultural uh, patterns that are putting women under a lot of risk in terms of violence. 
violence has increased. So you are talking about what type of society we will have if we don't include women. Well, we will have a very discontent society because women are the ones that are bringing, I would say, uh, mediation, that are bringing the care economy in all fronts of life, not only on, on education or children care. It's also the, taking care of the elder, of the most vulnerable. Women are the ones that are in the communities feeding people. So women have a sense of solidarity. I, I think men also, I don't want to leave men out of this, but I mean, solidarity is one of the things that we need to, to look into. And then of course the socioeconomic inequality where I think we have to do a lot of work in terms of, and, and there is progress in Latin America, I have to say, because we have been able to, to put this very high in the agenda in terms of equal pay for equal work. And I think that is already resonating in this region quite a bit. And the other thing we have to make sure that digital inclusion is at the, at the heart. And finally, I would say we need women's participation. And of course, I would say participation in high level sectors, sectors that are, have more high productivity and that receive uh, innovation has to be there. So I think that we, we have a full agenda to make sure that the progress that we have achieved in maternal mortality, which is huge, in infant mortality in this region, in education, because this region is, women are highly educated in this region, but we also need to take care of these other fronts that are so important, which is labor, which is economic autonomy, and of course, how can we make sure that political participation of women, both in public sector, but in private sector as well, uh, and their voices have to be heard. Thank you very much. And um, uh, real quick, if I may just uh, follow up on that. So we know that role modeling effects are real, right? They are empirical realities um, and um, do have impact. Uh, and then we, how might you, or what are some of the suggestions uh, that you might proffer for uh, dealing with these um, issue of um, um, visible leaders and their bellicosity towards gender equality and women's autonomy. Yes, Dr. Barson. No, very happy to say that because I think we have role models in the world that we have to highlight. For example, for me, a role model was Gro Harlem Brundtland because she made gender equality a reality in Norway by putting together public policies, the, the, the fiscal policies in place, and she really achieved a lot, not only by talking, but by doing, which is what we need. We have all the role models, for example, in Latin America and the Caribbean, I think Prime Minister Mia Motley Amor from Barbados is a great role model that uh, she's doing so much work for the Caribbean, for, for equality in general, she has a, a clear vision of, of, of a structural change. For me, the other role model is Michelle Bachelet, honestly. I think she is, from our region, a role model in terms of human rights, but also what she did when she was president of Chile. She advanced so much on gender equality. So that's from the political front, let's say. But we also have civil society people that are just wonderful. In this region, we have role models in civil society that are incredible. For me, one role model is Nancy Fulbright, who is sitting with us today because she has been uh, putting her life uh, really on these topics of the care economy. So, uh, so that's what we need. We need the voices of, and Anita, no question. I mean, you and woman has been doing a fantastic job. So we need to go further, but we need to go to the communities now. We need to be the voices of the women in the communities, high, uh, loud and clear for them to tell us what are their needs and how we can bring them into this uh, transformation. Right. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And um, last but not least, um, Anita. Look, I do think we need a paradigm shift. I don't think doing business as usual is going to work. I think Nancy's right when she says that climate change is an existential threat. Um, but I also do think that every crisis is an opportunity. And I have to be hopeful about the ability of us to work together to come out of this, um, you know, with some good solutions. And I, uh, you know, I, I think 
one of the things the pandemic has done is that it has shone a light on and brought into the public sphere things that were not talked about enough. Uh, for example, we knew before the pandemic that there was a real scourge of domestic and gender-based violence. But because of the pandemic, we actually had heads of state and heads of government talking about this as a public policy issue. You know, we had Scott Morrison of Australia talking about gender-based violence. We had the president of France talking about the need for France to book 20,000 hotel rooms for victims of domestic violence. Um, so, you know, the sh pandemic, and we called it a shadow pandemic, we call it a shadow pandemic of violence, shot into the spotlight in a way that I think years of lobbying had not been able to do. So in the same way, I think the pandemic has enabled uh, a spotlight on and drawn attention to the issue that you, Dr. Fulbright and others have been working on, which is the issue of unpaid care. And I feel that there is a real opportunity now to make this a real pillar of the, uh, uh, the way back and building back better. This would have been unheard of before the pandemic. So I think we have to seize on the opportunity that the pandemic has created to actually implement a different set of policies. And that paradigm shift, I think, is in the making. Uh, and I think we have to remain hopeful because without hope, um, you know, how are we going to have a tomorrow? Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have run out of time, uh, but let's just go ahead and put up uh, the last poll question. And so uh, this has been a really wonderful and enlightening conversation. Thank you so very much for being with us, Anita. Thank you for um, Dr. Barbara. Thank you, Dr. Baxena. Uh, we hope to do this again uh, sometime with you. And thank you, our audience, for uh, joining us today. Uh, we look forward to uh, you, know, you being with us again. And we are really looking forward to a future that uh, regards women as full citizens, uh, equal citizens of whatever country they are. And we're looking forward to, as uh, Anita said, a paradigm shift. Thank you. And um, we hope to, uh, that you will be with us again soon. Bye-bye.